welcome to the Simply Joyful Podcast with Christy Clover. Today, my special guest is none other than Michael and Smith. Get ready to be encouraged. Well, welcome, Michael, and I'm so thrilled to have you here on the show today. Oh my goodness, Christy, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. I like jumped all over the opportunity to have you on the show because I am such a big fan such a big fan and you put together the most beautiful stuff. And I have to say that this is my, me admitting to you right now, I am not a minimalist. And like when it comes to like home organization stuff, I'm all about like being efficient and being like smart about what you keep in your house, but not by any means a minimalist. So when I first saw your cozy minimalist book, I'm like, amen, sister, I can get behind that kind of minimalism. <laughs> so I love it. Um, so can you tell us about your newest book? It's so pretty. Um, welcome home. Yeah, it's called Welcome Home. And man, the tagline is a mouthful. I have to actually read it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. No, I get that. <laughs> but it's, um, <clears throat> I'm going to get my reading glasses, A Cozy Minimalist Guide to Decorating and Hosting All Year Round. So it's almost like a part two from that cozy minimalist uh, journey. And so this is like, well, how do I apply that to seasonal decorating and to hosting all those fun things that we want to do in our house, but then we get into the store or we invite people over and we're like, why did I do that? <laughs> oh yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's what we do, right? <laughs> and I love it because I, well, yeah. and I love it because I, I have a question regarding that. But first I've realized that for people who don't know you and aren't familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of all that you do, or at least some oh, of what I you do, because you do a lot. Oh, well, <laughs> I don't know about that. My name is Mike Willen Smith. And when I first started on the internet 13 years ago, I just kind of felt like it was full of Unabombers and killers. And so to put my real unique, weird spelling name out there felt like I was just asking to be murdered. So I used the nester. I had like a little local business called Nesting Place. So that just made sense. And really the reason I started was because I wanted to leave a comment on Pioneer Woman's blog and have like my face there instead of a weird empty gravatar. No <laughs> so way. that's why I started and I thought, well, I can talk about home stuff. And it just went from there. I mean, really, just like everyone, I had an imperfect uh, home, a place that was not my dream house. And so I just wrote about kind of how I was approaching that, things I would do. Um, we lived in a rental many times. And so little fixes I would make on a budget. Um, so now, 13 years later, I love encouraging women in their home. I love that I don't have to go to anyone's house. I'm not moving anyone's recliner, but my goal is to help women create the home they've always wanted so that they can use it the way they've always dreamed. Because none of us want a pretty house so we can impress people. We really want a home that feels like us, a home that we feel confident in, feels like our style, that we love in a way so we can stop thinking about it and so we can just use it. I love that. That's so good. And you kind of, well, I don't even remember where it is. <laughs> I'm like you open with, well, wait a minute. I think you open with it. But one of the things that I think is so beautiful is you talk about how we need to be embra embracing. And I love I'm like, yes, sister, embracing the imperfectionist mindset. And I love that because I'm always telling people let go perfectionism, but I'm like, oh, I like the fact we should embrace imperfection. And you share a story that I think everyone relates to because we've all had that moment and can you share the story and I like how you talk about the trust issue so I don't want to I don't want to ruin it so oh, can yeah you no that? I'm happy to share the story so my whole first book was all about really embracing where you are and how to live in an imperfect house in a place that's not your dream house because I finally realized I got to stop waiting on the next house and one of the things that made me realize that was stories like this one which is um we when Chad and I were first married we rented one of the oldest, literally oldest houses in the little Southern town that we were in. And so it was over a hundred years old at the time. And it was wow. just kind of a disaster. It had orange formica countertops. It had a green stove that was like faded to yellow. Like just every part of it needed Brady a lot. Bunch. Of yeah. And it had been a rental for a long time. So um, it just was not up to par with all of my friends at the time who we happened to live in a town that had like a, an attorney school and a doctor school. So everyone at our church was either had a husband who was a doctor or an attorney or learning to be that. And they all had these like new beautiful homes in my perception. I'm sure that wasn't even true. And then here we are, my husband's a school teacher. We had this little $500 a month rental that was, that had bars on the window that I was embarrassed of. And 
I spent the day with a friend whose husband was, I don't know, studying to be a doctor, I believe, who had a really pretty house. She was precious. Um, we went out for the day together and she dropped me back in my driveway and asked if she could use the bathroom. And I told her no, because I, I'm sure my bathroom wasn't like super clean, but it wasn't oh. that. It was that I was so ashamed of our house mm -hmm. in the shape of our bathroom and the, the tile that was probably from the thirties and the window that was falling apart that I was not comfortable with her coming in. And so to me, I felt like I was protecting myself, but looking back, you know, 25 years later, I'm able to look at that and say, that makes me so sad because really what I was saying is, hey friend that I just spent all day with, that I go to church with, who's just giving me a hug and dropping me off in my driveway, you cannot be trusted with the imperfections of my life. We're not there yet. And I think that's a really horrible thing to tell a sweet friend. And so now I know the truth of like what that was really saying and what I was really doing by not letting her come in. At the time I thought, oh, I mean, so protective of myself and this is the right thing to do. But um, it took a few things like that for me to realize like, this is not, this is not how I want to live my life. Uh, God provided this rental house for us. And this is what we can afford right now. So listen, my husband was teaching at the Christian school where everyone was sending their kids. It probably would have been helpful for them to see the truth of what that pays for in the first place. Um, but also she could have been trusted with that. And I know that the people that can't be trusted with that are not dropping me off and giving me a hug and asking right. if they can use my bathroom. So those types of things actually made me realize how important imperfection can be like when we think about our own hospitality experiences like think back to the last time you experienced like a really meaningful hospitable time it probably wasn't a dinner party that you had printed invitations for and there was a violinist playing and like hors d'oeuvres it was probably an impromptu time you stopped by a friend's house your kids were running around she poured you a cup of coffee and you were connected with and you were heard and you were welcomed into the imperfect and as I learned and thought more about that, I realized not only are imperfections like this hindrance or this thing I need to hide, but actually imperfections are like a partner with us. Because mm -hmm. every friendship I had, the reason it went deeper is because we shared the imperfect. We dared to trust. And someone has to go first with that. So I am a huge, huge supporter of not only like, hey, we all had to be okay with not being perfect, nobody's perfect, no. Like with making sure that we are okay sharing those imperfect things and allowing those things to be seen and not hidden when it's someone we can trust with that. Yeah, it's, it's so true. And I think back to all of those moments, especially early in marriage, before I even had kids. <laughs> like now I got five kids, so I'm like, whatever, come on in. <laughs> So I'm like, just, just know I have no, like people use my bathroom now. I'm like, I haven't looked in there. I uh, hopefully it's good. <laughs> and little people, hopefully it was flushed. It was good. Like a half an hour ago. I can tell you that. But, um, yeah, like I think back to like the first things I hosted. Cause that, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm like well into my forties, like I'm, I'm nearing the other side of it. And I have to say that, you know, I had Martha Stewart as this like pedestal person. You saw these mm -hmm. like 10 course meals that she would put on and it was intimidating. And so like, I literally, the first party I threw, I think I made like everything from scratch from of course, Martha Stewart living. And, you know, we had all these elaborate things and I tried, even though we were like these little, little homes or little apartments, but I tried so hard to put on perfection. And I think that's a trap we all fall into. And I would even say like the first few birthday parties, they were elaborate for the kids. And then I remember the first time I had a birthday party for one of my boys and I'm like, okay, this year we had <laughs> that one. I'm like, we have too many kids. I'm like, it's going to be cupcakes and some friends and here's a bowl of pretzels. And my son after he told me that was the best party ever. And I'm like, but I didn't plan anything. He's like, it was so fun. And I'm like, but I served cupcakes and not like this cake that was like a picture of the theme of whatever. And that was like this, like aha moment for me. And so I love that. And what I also think is really cool is I'm going to go ahead and jump over to, cause you're talking about hospitality. And one of the things I really connected with in your book is your hospitality trinity. I thought that was hysterical and it's so good. So can you share what that is and, you know, and kind of elaborate like what, what we kind of think it needs to be and what it like the simple version of hosting. And so I love that because I have a heart for hospitality. And so I love that 
you really pulled that in. I mean, every single section of your book has hospitality in it. <laughs> well, I think we make hospitality so complicated to the point where we put it off because unfortunately, yeah. exactly what you said, especially if you're our age, uh, the only person that we had speaking into our young life was Martha Stewart, who mm -hmm. God love her. I mean, she's brilliant. She's gorgeous. Right. She's so talented. But it was, I mean, the calendar at the end of Martha Stewart living every day, it was like, sharpen your lawnmower blades, clean out the refrigerator <laughs> and boil them. And it was, I needed like three of me just to do what she, right. and that was the only person. We didn't have Instagram. We didn't have people no. showing behind the scenes and the messy sofa and the laundry. We had her. And so that kind of set, set the precedence and her hosting was like, outdoor with hay rides and beautiful dogs and costumes and like everything homemade and pumpkins and, and so it felt like that was the only way now we have different <laughs> we have more than that which is so helpful and I think she's even moved away from that a little bit but um I love to just really simplify like what is what is the least amount we need to think about and still have a hospitable spirit or a hospitable home or attitude and so for me the, the three things the trinity is the mood the food and the people if you think about those things, Love it. you don't need to worry about anything else. And so the mood is just like setting the atmosphere. And that could be, you know, if it's Thanksgiving, maybe you want some seasonal decor. Uh, a lot of times for me, the mood definitely involves in playlist because I think that fills in the gaps and Ooh. it sets the mood. Uh, lighting sets the mood. What you smell, like all the five senses are setting that mood for us. Um, and then the food. I love to cook. I don't love to bake, but I love love to cook, but I found that if I get too overly ambitious, and most of us either like, we love to cook or we hate to cook. <laughs> so we're somewhere in that. Right. Uh, and so when we have people over, we either go too far. We're like, I'm going to make everything from scratch. Or we're like, I don't want to have people over because I can't make anything. So no matter who you are, I say you need to follow these two. You need to follow this rule, which is you can make two things from scratch and everything else is store bought or others brought. So you can either buy it from the store or yeah. from the restaurant. Or you can ask people to bring it if, if that's the kind of gathering you're having. So even though I love, I really, really enjoy cooking. It's like a, a, I don't know, relaxing to me. I know if I am in charge of like 20 things, stirring and baking and timing and sauteing, then that takes my mindset away from being able to pay attention to my guests when they arrive, being able to pay attention to like my own self and my kids and my family and all those things that, that come into play in the moment most important part about having people over is connecting with them. So if right. I want to be in the right place for that, then I am only allowed to make two things <laughs> max. Uh, so that's the food part. And then the people is the other part. And I always say there are three people to think about. Number one it might sound selfish, but you need to think about yourself first. Like if you are not in a place, if you are not in a healthy place to have people over this Saturday night, then I believe you should cancel. There is nothing worse Absolutely. than showing up at someone's home and you can tell they've had a hard week or they can't quite focus or maybe they forgot you were coming. Do not be afraid to postpone or cancel if someone's coming over and it's just not right for your family. I think that's the number one thing to do. Uh, so evaluate if you're going to be in the right mood to listen, to connect, to respond, because that is why they're coming over. They're not coming over to get entertained. They're not coming over to be impressed with you. We all, no one wants that. They're coming over to know and be known. So if you're in the mood to do that, if you're in the right mindset to do that, then great. The next person to think about, obviously, is your guest. So we all always think about our guests. Um, but we want to think about, I know I'm in the right frame of mind if I'm not thinking like, <gasps> Oh, my mantle's a mess. I need to redo that. Oh, what am I going to wear? My hair. Like if it's not me focused, but if I'm like, oh, you know, I remember our guests, like Susie's daughter started kindergarten this week. I want to ask her about that. Or, you know, her husband uh, was talking about applying for a new job. So when you're thinking about what is happening in their life and what you can connect mm. with in the last time you saw them, that's a trigger. That's like a, that helps me know I'm in the right mindset. And then lastly, Took me a while to get to this one. Um, but the other person you need to think about is anyone else that lives in your home who's going to be around when, when your guests are coming over. And especially your kids. I mean, my husband and I are usually on the same page, like, yay, we're having people. But your kids, if they're bringing children over, really need to be um, like invited in, but warned and also to know what they are um, 
well, let me give you an example. So we have an introvert, we have a couple introverts. And so if I didn't kind of sit down beforehand and say, okay, we've got some kids coming over, they're your age, they're probably gonna go up in your room. So if you don't have Legos, if you have some like Lego masterpieces that you don't want broken, let's, let's take 10 minutes and like put them on the high shelf or we'll put them in my office and just kind of, Re, you know, help them remember what it's like to have people over. I, I would say like, they're going to stay until nine o'clock. And so you could go outside, you can do this, you could do that, you can watch a show together. Um, and just kind of give permission and a reminder of what we do when we have guests. And the other thing is just to be mindful. Like when I said that first uh, person I think about is me, and if I'm in the right mindset, well, my kids don't have a say. My kids don't get to say, well, mom, I'm not quite in the right mindset to host other kids. Like, <laughs> He's seven, you know, or was at the time. <laughs> but that might mean just me being um, a mom who pays attention, to, especially to my kids that have a higher need for alone time. If they come home from school and then go outside to play with friends, and then they're supposed to be in to dinner, and they're going to like entertain these other seven-year-olds that are coming over. And then maybe an hour later, he ends up downstairs alone playing the piano. I'm not going to go down there. Like, I can't go down there and fuss and be like, you got to get up there and play with your Like, no. I allowed myself some downtime. And so I think part of uh, teaching our kids how to be hospitable and to know themselves is to help them be aware of what they need. And so maybe it's like, you know what? You might not want to go out and play with kids today. You might want to have your alone time for an hour. Save now. the energy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that's so brilliant. Yeah, because it's, it's really easy to get stuck in all the trappings of hosting and all that stuff. And, and I, I really love that you're saying that you to think about your kids too, because our typical rule is we have friends over. It's about like engaging and, you know, we kind of go through, we do the same thing. We kind of like prep everybody from the standpoint of these are things we think that you guys might have in common. If it's a new family and especially if there's younger kids coming, because now that my, my older two are, I mean, they're like, I have an adult in the house now, but you now they're teens. And so, you know, if there's just babies coming over, I'm like, we kind of, we let them do their thing. We have them come down and meet everyone and then they get to go do their thing. Cause otherwise they feel like, oh, I'm just here to babysit. And that's not why they're, they're coming down. <laughs> so <laughs> it's really cool. And I love that you talked to, cause this is what we do with our kids too. We're like, if there's something you don't want to share with friends who are coming over, then by all means go put it away out of sight because it will probably get played with or potentially broken. Um, so we, we definitely do like a quick, not even so much like a cleanup, it's a protect up <laughs> to make sure that, it, especially when we have friends that have a lot of little kids, it's hard to manage all of the little kids. So yeah. it's just, that's the fact of life. And sometimes we'll just have a, yeah, we're not going upstairs today. So, and that's just what we do. I mean, granted little kids that usually end up toddling up at some point. <laughs> So yeah, it's, it is like just having the, that mindset really does help. So I love it. Well, your book, one of the things I love about it is that each chapter, well, actually you have the four sections, which are broken down into seasons and each chapter has something on decorating. Thank you. I just have to say, thank you for that. Um, and then the next section uh, or the next part of that is on hosting. Um, and with hosting, you, you'd go through, I think it's within, is it decorating a host? you talk about the five senses and bringing out the five senses and things. And I had to laugh because um, in my last chapter of my MOM book, um, I talk about how you should bring the senses out. And I have to tell you, I giggled because I'm like, okay, like I was just giving examples for like all over the house. And I was trying to think of like all the senses and there's, I think it was texture. I'm like, okay, I can get around texture. And um, I think it was like, you know, you can get music and taste and all that. Like I could think of a few, but I was trying to give at least three examples. And then I'm like, oh man, you like did whole sections and I'm like, I love it. I didn't even think of that. So I love that you were very intentional about just pulling in the five senses to each season. Um, so that is, I think it's so, so fun. So I think people are really going to enjoy that. Now, um, what I want to find out because you talk about decorating for the seasons. And so like in my brain, I can kind of get behind. I decorate for fall. I'm more pumpkin heavy around like, you know, Halloween and early fall. And then I kind of move over to Turkey time, you know, around Thanksgiving. But, um, I am that person that has a lot of bins, um, for Christmas. Um, I really, I enjoy Christmas. And when you were saying, do you get burdened by it? I'm like, maybe a little bit now that I'm <laughs> over like getting all the bins out and I'm trying really hard 
to not go crazy. But can you talk a little bit about that mind shift, that mindset shift of like the consumer mindset and the creator mindset? Because I, pro- I, pro- I this is me like, okay, my name's Christy Clover and I have a lot of Christmas bins. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a Christmas addict and I know I need to slow it down a little. Well, you know, I don't know that that's necessarily true, Christy. I think everyone is allowed to set their own boundaries. So mm. who I wrote this book for, or at least this, this Christmas section is for anyone that is feeling burdened when they think about getting their Christmas decor out. When you get to that point, that's when this chapter is really going to help help you. But I don't want it to be like, hey, this is me telling everyone you should only have three bins for Christmas because that's what I have. No, there's no threshold. There's no like, you get to pick how much you want. But I will tell you this, if you are dreading getting out your Christmas decor, then I can help you. And so if you ever get to that point, and you might not, like my threshold might be three, yours might be 30. And if you have the room to store that, and if you have the capacity for that, I say more power to you. That That is lovely. But I know for me, I found myself getting really burdened with like dreading getting up in the attic, lugging those bins up. Then I'd open them up and I hated half the stuff in it, <laughs> but I just oh, kept no. it. You know, yeah. like, well, like, well, I kept it. I didn't use it last year, but I wasn't sure to get rid of it. So I just kept it or like someone gave it to you. And so you thought you should yeah. just, maybe you'll use it in your next house. That's a big one for me. <laughs> oh yeah. The next house. I'm always saving it for my next house. Or I found it at a good deal. It doesn't quite work in here, but I like it, but I haven't used it. So there were a million different reasons. It wasn't just like, Oh, I bought all this ugly stuff. No. I think a lot of us do that. Many of us, we put out our Christmas decorations. We have Christmas. It's time to put it away. We bring out the bins and they're half full of stuff we haven't used in three years. And so that was a little bit of my experience. And I just thought, you know what, there has to be another way for me. And so one of the things I did was I just decided up front how many bins I was going to allow myself to store and set that boundary, which has helped. But I also decided instead of approaching each season like, how do you decorate for spring? How do you decorate for Christmas? No, I think of it differently. So I approach each Mm. season. And when I approach the season and I seasonalize my home, it is automatically ready for the celebrations. So when you think about Christmas, Christmas is not the season. Christmas is a celebration. Winter is the season. And so if Mm. I first winterize my home and I work through the five senses of the experience that anyone that walks into my home is going to have through what they smell, what they taste, what they feel, uh, what they hear. And then lastly, what they see. I add that last usually because I find I need a lot less. Then as it comes closer, because I a lot of times will like seasonalize. Christmas is a little different. Winter and Christmas are different. But a lot of times I'll start seasonalizing for winter around Thanksgiving. And then the day after Thanksgiving, this doesn't mean I have my tree up that early. I might. I don't think that's wrong. But um, I'm winterizing my home before I Christmasize it. Ooh, so it's I like that. That's a, a new word. Less. Yeah. And then, so the same with spring, like I'm, I'm not decorating with bunnies and eggs, but I want my spring home to feel different uh, than my fall home. And it automatically should, because a lot of times my, I require different things in the spring than I do in the fall from my home based on activities, based on what we're getting ready to do. I, I like to garden. So I'm, I'm mm. tracking in mud and dirt and all kinds of things like that. The animals are coming in and tracking in dirt. So, you know, just it's raining all those things that we can think about like, Oh, how does this affect the function of my home? Mm. And then what layers of the season can I add through the senses? And then when it comes to host for Halloween or host the baby shower or have fourth of July, your home already feels like it's in keeping with the season. And maybe you add a few flags, or maybe you add, you know, whatever it is that feels seasonal to you, some pumpkins or, or what have you. It has made the way I host, which it's in, that's why this book is on both of those topics, which is like the, the seasonalizing or the decorating for the season. And then the hosting, because there's something freeing when you feel like your home is in keeping with the season it really does feel like it's much more ready to have people over. It's like a trick that I play on myself. (laughs) So I'm more ready. I don't have as many excuses now to host because my house feels ready. I love that. And it's, I think that's, it's such a good point. Like everyone has a different threshold. And when you said um, your set number of bins, I'm like Dana White. (laughs) Oh, container thing is so brilliant. 100% credit. I talked to her yesterday and I was like, I that you, Dana. All you. Yes, she is our decluttering guru. Slob comes clean. You need to declutter. I'm not your girl for that. She is. 
Oh, she's so great. I know I had her on the podcast and I had her on when I was still in book launch mode. Oh, like, you know, book writing mode. I'm like, okay, I had to pick chapters that like don't have anything to do with what's in my, <laughs> what's coming out. This is just being really careful. Um, but I'm like, you got to talk with the containers because she's got so many great little systems. And it's funny because as soon as the book was turned in, I'm like devouring everyone's book because I'm like, I love it. <laughs> so <laughs> it's so fun. But Dana's fabulous. So we'll, we'll link. I've had her on the show before. So we'll link to all of her stuff there. Um, and it, it, depending on who comes out first with your interview, I'll have to link to your interview with her. So <laughs> She's fabulous. Um, but it, it is important to know that every person is different. And when we start playing that comparison game, everybody loses. It's not fun. And especially you, like, you, you know, it does not help. And I always giggle because in, in my like dream world, I would have a different set of dishes for every season. And I would have like for every, not even just every season, like all the fun things. And so what, I, that's just in my brain. That's what I was like, like, oh, and so what I've done instead is I have this cute little wall hanging thing and I have like three plates that uh, represent the season and I change those out just periodically. And then I have like my summer, I was giggling because I'm like, my, my summer, my summer decorating is look, here's my house. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're just here for the pool. So we'll just take you straight Listen, back. Listen, <laughs> I realize for summer and you don't even realize it. You're already doing it. Oh, it's so funny. No, because I was like, oh, I guess I don't really do summer, but <laughs> I'm... <laughs> We do have our flags. I don't, I don't have summer. It's not about like having summer decor. Like, oh, it's all yeah. lake time. Like, I'm not, it's not that. It's just more of like recognizing yeah. what's happening outside and bringing that in. Or like you said, like we have pool in our backyard, having all those towels, sitting yeah. out on the, you know, hanging and ready for people. So you do are naturally doing these things with the season. I want you to give yourself credit for it. Yay. Okay. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, the Nesta told me I'm doing it right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for this book. And thank you for your time. And there's like 500 million questions I could think to ask you, but we don't have time for all that. <laughs> but um, anything else that you're really hoping that people will take away with your book and um, just kind of maybe a little bit about like your heart, like what you want people to be like, please read this. <laughs> I just want people to love and use their home. I think uh, mm. so many of us are waiting on the next house and compared to your last house, you are in your next house. And so I feel like, I feel like even now with, um, you know, COVID and everything, I feel like our homes, the homes all across the world have a big smile on their face because we are using them. We are paying attention to how they can best serve us. And that is what home is for. So I am here if you need encouragement in your home like i just want to be the person to say try it take that risk move that table if you hate it move it back like whatever it is i think uh risks are home is a great place to take a risk and man is it worth it if we can't take a risk at home where can we oh i love it and actually you said one thing that it made me think of something you mentioned your book is shopping your own home and I think that's, we get stuck sometimes in our homes and just thinking, well, well, that lamp goes there and that plant, it belongs there. Um, and I have to say that that is something that I learned really early on is sometimes when I'm decluttering or cleaning or organizing, I strip things like out of the room. And that's when I kind of have a moment of like, what do I want right here? And so it is so fun to do just that. And, um, but thank you for this book. It's so beautiful. It's so fun. And I thoroughly enjoy it. Like, again, like I, one of those crazy podcast people, and I haven't met, you are actually one of my last podcast episodes. So there we go. Oh my. <laughs> I know it's kind of fun. I'm slowing down. I'm taking my own advice and <laughs> slowing things down. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but I, I don't always like read all the book and, and, um, but this one I'm like, it's going to sit on my table and I get to enjoy it. So it's just, it's so fun. So I really encourage folks out there to check out welcome home. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be fast enough to get this episode out for people to get your, um, pre-order bonus. But, um, if, if you are listening to this before it officially comes out, then run and get a copy <laughs> so you can get the pre-order bonuses. Um, cause it's so fun. Um, but will you have the, the pre-order bonuses available anywhere afterwards or no? 
every now and then, um, I want to say before, like sometimes we just pop up a quick little like Black Friday for 24 hours, okay. you can claim the pre. So keep your eyes open because okay. I, it's fun to surprise people with that. I can't guarantee it. I'm not in total control over that. So my publisher has something to say yeah, about right. that. I know. But <laughs> historically that has happened. It's just not like a scheduled thing. And the pre-order, sometimes I think I write a book just so I can make the pre-order bonus. It's that fun for me. <laughs> You're adorable. I was like, oh, I got to get mine done. <laughs> oh, yeah, so fun. I'm like, I just want to make pre-order bonuses. <laughs> oh, wow. I, know, it's a- <laughs> I think it's adorable. Oh, well, where can people find you online and where can they find the book and all that good stuff? Oh, if you go to thenester.com, you can find everything you need. And I hang out daily on Instagram. It's my favorite because I'm so visual. It gives daily tips. So um, I'm the Nestor over on Instagram. Oh, well, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming on. And it was just such a joy to have you on the show today. It was fun to be here. Thanks, Christy. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Simply Joyful Podcast. Be sure to check out all the episodes available by going to simplyjoyfulpodcast.com. Also, be sure to subscribe here on YouTube so you don't miss all of the other videos that we have coming your way. Have a great rest of your week and don't forget to live simply and be joyful.